Legarius is Lagon. Let's talk about it. This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. It's an extremely live. <laughs> oh, got him. <laughs> Dinky. <laughs> It's a live edition of the Casey Laboratory presented by Emprise Bank member FDIC. Can owners vote on this guy? Can the <laughs> owners vote on this guy, please? Hey, can you let me talk about how much I love and appreciate Emprise Bank first Go before ahead. you please, guys please move do. on? Go ahead. Please do. Rip Our wonderful Start partners in Possible. Fine. It's a live edition. Oh, do you want me to start at the very, very top? Yes. Legarius is Lagan. Let's talk about it. We appreciate you supporting Casey's. It's a live edition of the KC Laboratory presented by Emprise Bank, member FDIC, our absolutely wonderful partners in Possible. So appreciative of them. They've been day one supporters of KC Sports Network, and they are an absolutely wonderful partner. They are partners uh, with me on the KCSN Draft Guide. They are the banking provider for uh, for that. And uh, so I put my money where my mouth is with them. I've loved working with, with Emprise Bank, our partners in Possible. This is a live edition of the KC Laboratory. I'm very excited to be with my two dear pals, Matthew Lane and Craig Stout. We are all three together for the first time since the Legarius Sneed news. Matthew, hi. How are we? I, I don't know. This is a very clean start to this show. Um, we're <laughs> handling this about as well as the Chiefs handled these uh, Legarius Sneed negotiations. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we're doing good. You guys got to talk about this a little bit when it happened. I did it, so I'm glad to be here. I'm glad we get to talk about it again. Talk Sneed's gone, where the Chiefs go from here. This isn't going to be so much about the trade, I don't think. We'll talk a little bit more about where the Chiefs are going from here, but I'm just happy to be hanging out with you guys. Uh, I, I'm glad that Craig's here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here as well, Maddie. Thank, thank you for introing me. I really like that Tucker was on top of the ad break. He, he dropped that little short one in there. That that really sold it really, really well there. I don't appreciate Kent's joke that he made so um yeah i i too have some more thoughts on the legerious knee mm-hmm. trade so um yeah we, we should probably dive into that a little bit more Ken. we should get into this we haven't heard maddie's takes at all so i want to start with just an overarching thought just um you know your feelings as we sit here three-ish days you know, the Chiefs tried to slip something back past the breaking news team, and the breaking news team was ready on a Friday night to rock. And so I just, you know what? You can't I mean, slip the Chris it Jones past stuff the breaking was news. later at night on a Saturday, Kent. Like, they, they're, they're trying to test the breaking news team right now. You can doubt <laughs> the breaking news. Oh. <laughs> Stop. Okay. You can oh. disrespect once again, the Chiefs make a move when my kids decide to have a sleepover downstairs right outside my office so I cannot participate. So that, you know, thanks for that, Chiefs. No, it, it might not have been bad. It seemed like the breaking news team was on it. There was enough people ready to go to talk about Legereus Sneed. It was fun to watch y'all talk about that. Um, takes on that. Takes on the Legereus Sneed trade. I don't know. It, it was clearly the best offer they were going to get because the only team left at the table was the Tennessee Titans. So anybody I think that is upset by the return that the Chiefs got, it's just that's all that was left, right? That's the only thing that they had left available to trade luxurious need for. And they've made it abundantly clear whether, you know, we like it, we don't like it. They valued having that money available more so than they valued one more year of luxurious Sneed. Like that's just, at the end of the day, that's what it was. They wanted the $20 million to be available more so than they wanted to pay luxurious need $20 million for one year. We will see how they use that money. I don't love the timing. If this was all you were going for in return, we couldn't have got this done a little bit earlier. Maybe had that money available earlier in free agency. I know Ken's point is going to be, tell me who they missed out on. I don't know which exact player, but there's been plenty of players that are going to matter in the NFL this year that signed a free agency contract that they never got a chance to pay because they were waiting on to get this move done. So I just wish it would have been done earlier. I understand. I understand everything else and why it happened. I understand the why as well. Like, I, I, I don't get me wrong. I understand the why. My feelings for having Legereus need on this defense are strong. I think that, you know, as I shared on the live stream, he does so much for what Steve Spagnuolo can 
operate with on the back end there and the coverages that he can run and the blitzes that he can call. I just think that he's so much of a weapon, but it's not like we didn't know this was coming. You know, it, it's not a surprise that this happened. And unfortunately, the compensation isn't really a surprise either. It, re- it stinks that it's not more. I think that Legereus Need is worth more to this team and its current thing, playing on the franchise tag and contributing to this defense. But to Maddie's point, to Kent's point, to everybody's point at this point, now that we've kind of let the dust settle, they've got about $20 million that they can use now in free agency, in cash, whatever it is that was, you know, the hold up there that could have restructured lots of guys to create the space. Maybe it is cash. Whatever it is, they've got moves that they can make now. We haven't heard any of them yet. The longer that we go without hearing any of these yet, not like a whole bunch of guys have been signed, but it makes me wonder what the urgency to try and pull the trigger on it at the point that it was it kind of brings in. I think all of us, when that trade occurred and everybody was talking about how, oh, they got cap space to sign guys now, this can happen. I I expected that we would be doing a Mike Dana breaking news segment by now. Like I, I did. I kind of thought it, it just makes all the sense in the world to bring a guy like that back to kind of look out there. Who are the the running backs that are still out there? Wide receivers that are still out there? Offensive linemen that are still out there? There are moves that can be made. And even though Legereus Need is gone, I still think that this team as a whole, with smart moves and that money, can raise the floor from what they were last year, even as a Super Bowl champion. I really do feel like they can spread that around a little bit more, improve lots of different positions, make themselves – a little more bulletproof from some of the things that other defenses or offenses want to do with them. It still doesn't take away my desire to have Legereus Need on this team, but I'm waiting to see what the cascading moves are going to be because that's in truth what's really going to determine the value of this trade. Definitely. And my my take is more about who do they miss on, right, Maddie? It's more about just like it, it, if, if I know that the Chiefs missed on some guys because of how they've handled this situation, that's where I think some of my frustration will lie is if we know for sure that, you know, that they've missed out on some players that they would have otherwise been able to acquire in free agency if they had found resolution with the Legere Sneed situation a lot quicker. Maddie, did you listen to the breaking news team by any chance? Or did you? I, I think you're in the comments making fun of me at some point. Correct. Um, yes. I did do that. He doesn't need to listen to do that for what it's worth. I was in and out. I was I was in and out of there. I got the gist of what you all were saying. I was agreeing, you know, with bits and pieces that I heard here and there. And it's just I I think this is the point where it is. I think everybody understands kind of why there's not just us here, but like everybody understands why this happened, why the compensation, why the return was, was what it was, what the chiefs, you know, or hopefully what we all want the chiefs to do next. The problem is to, to Craig's point. I think we all kind of expected a move to come in by now, even if it was something as simple as bringing back one of their guys, nothing has yet. And now it seems like there's very a very real possibility, especially the way national media was talking about this stuff right after the move. The Chiefs now have money to re, to extend guys already under contract, like a Nick Bolton, like a Trey Smith. They they were real quick to start to, Creed Humphrey, real quick to start talking about the moves the Chiefs need to make in the future. Is what this money might be earmarked for, rather than improving the team right now. And if that's the plan then I get a little bit, you know, then it's not as good to me. Then I'm like, okay, why, 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 why as much? So we'll have to see how it plays out from here. I'm kind of in a wait and see situation still. And that speaks to cash. If that's the case, the, mm-hmm. that it's coming out there, that that speaks to cash. I know everybody looks at it as cap space, but yeah. you know, they, they Clark Hunt's got to throw that money into escrow and he's got to throw a guaranteed franchise tag. You know, basically he's got to pony that up immediately if he's looking at this and going, hey, I can have signing bonuses or guaranteed money for Creed Humphrey and Nick Bolton locked up with roughly that same amount, not saying, you know, not trying to project yeah. contracts here. It's probably going to be more than that. But if he wanted to get that done, if the organization has told him we need to get these two guys done, Legereus Need on top of that changes the cash flow metrics, changes what they were able to do. They threw a bunch of cash at Chris Jones. There's a reason why they delayed, you know, basically the guaranteed money in year three guarantees next year. That's to help out with cash flow. Like that's that's exactly what that's there for. So 
it speaks to that maybe more than saying we've got an arsenal of players that we want to line up and sign. But in the same token, you've got that cap space. Like, use it. You you definitely need to use it to try and keep making this team better. I, I think that's kind of where I, I wanted to go a little bit before we kind of move on to some other stuff is I, I don't think it's like too big of a secret about the cash side of things to Craig's point. And I'm glad he brought it up. I think I'm, uh, criticism isn't the right word. The Chiefs have won two Super Bowls. The Chiefs have tons of resources and it's not like they're in the bottom of spending uh, in in the NFL. They tend to be from a cash perspective in the middle uh, the middle tier, the, the, the mid-range, the lower end of the middle class when it comes to cash spending. Um, but I don't think... I, I think it's worth at least paying attention to when you have the best player on the planet, when you have a, cert, a, a bona fide superstar at their quarterback position and you've won two Super Bowls, and you have a chance to do something that nobody's ever done. I, I'm paying attention a little bit just with everything, with with some of the some of the buzz that you've heard about the NFLPA reporting and the lack of cash that this team seems to be operating with in their choices. Because you're right, the cash that they're going to hand out for future contracts relative to helping the 2024 Chiefs three peat. I'm just. I'm, I'm my antenna is up. I'm up, I'm observing, and I think you know the last couple of years have been worth paying a little bit of attention to. You know, right? So, like, give Clark Hunt credit for spending on Chris Jones, um, and and and, and doling out that cash for that. But I, there's always, I think there's always a, the the cash piece of this is always going to be a piece of the story that we don't have all of the context for, never. and we're never going to, and we may not always ascribe the criticism appropriately because of the constraints that people are operating under at all times and cash Whether real constraints or self-imposed constraints i, would, I also yeah. want to add that there's there's not a team besides maybe there's maybe like one or two other nfl teams br- making as much money as the chiefs are right now for their owner so to be in the as you put it the bottom middle class tier of cash spending. And I think they actually might be lower if I'm remembering right on the, I think it was a over the cap chart. They were far left on cash spending average over the past couple seasons. It's just they're, they are way too successful. They are making way too much money as a team because of the success they've had to be that low. And for me to fully un- like not say, Hey, maybe some of this is by choice, not a requirement. And like, I don't, I can't say that for certain. It's just a thought going on in my head. So if this is a move entirely made to save cash for the future to keep other guys around, man, that's tough. I like that they're looking ahead. I like the thought process to look ahead. I am never about going all in for one year. I think that was the initial issue with run it back. Even though they made it back to the Super Bowl, guess what? It set them back the following year. The year after run it back is when they paid the piper for trying to run it back. So like, I like that you look ahead, but if you were, if you can't, get this team going because the cash flow is so tight or you want it to be so tight for just future moves while the team is actively as of this moment, taking a step back on defense. And I mean, maybe even as a whole, when you're talking about all the guys they've lost on defense as of right now, and then you're not willing to spend any more this year on that. You're just, you're marking it for next year for other guys. That's a tough pill to swallow for a future third round pick and a seventh round pick swap. And for what it's worth, we don't know that yet. And, yeah. you know, yeah, to, sure. to tag time. up with just all of that. They, yes. There's still plenty of time. We're, we're just yes. theor- theorizing here. The other part of this, because I think everybody looks at this as future contracts. Oh, that means Nick Bolton and Creed Humphrey. And I know how some people feel about paying interior offensive linemen. I know how some people feel about paying linebackers. I'm not even looking at those two guys specifically. When the Chiefs redid Patrick Mahomes' contract last offseason, do you guys remember the caveat that came with that? They are set to discuss another contract in 2025. Guys, if Clark Hunt's getting ready to – I mean, he shelled out 
five hundred million dollars, you know, uh, over ten years for a Patrick Mahomes contract. Now, not all of that was guaranteed, so it's not. Like I don't think he had to put all that. He didn't have to put very much into escrow. He didn't have to, but he's paying it year over year. If he's looking ahead and going, oh, Patrick's not going to let me get away with those guarantees next year. Uh, guess what? There, th- there's a completely different story that we can talk about here. If it's we can't we had to trade luxurious need because we're earmarking this cash for the future for nick bolton and creed humphrey versus we couldn't you know we had to get rid of luxurious need because we're about to pay the best player in the planet an insane amount of money because i don't think anybody's gonna argue with that at this point because you you've allowed him to do what he does so i've also got an ear on that as well if that's part of this as well which we'll never know, <laughs> then, uh, you know, it, it makes it a little, a lot more palatable if it's going towards Patrick Mahomes. And in the context of cash, the cash that Legere Steen would be getting a guarantee contract, that's cash. And so extending Legere Steen also required 55 million from the Tennessee Titans. That's more than 20 million too. It's just like, I, I could see it. Even if they use all the cap space, it's not maybe it maybe it isn't long term cash investments that we're talking about here. Multi year deals. The multi year deals get handed out two weeks ago, so maybe we're not even talking about we're talking about one year deals that you know are going to require less less cash. That context, if it, and I think I said it at the top of the show or you know the the top of the the breaking news team. You know, I I had my doubts about how serious the Chiefs were about LeJarrius Sneed ever playing in a Chiefs uniform after they chose Chris Jones to extend Chris Jones. The context of cash could be something worth talking about there. You know, that's, and and the way that the Chiefs tried to play it is they wanted to try to get some guaranteed assets that had nothing to do with the compensatory formula. They came out ahead of the compensatory formula by doing this. Did it take some time? Yes, it did. Uh, did they miss out on any opportunities because of this? Don't know. But I think they were just trying to get anything that they possibly could out of Jerry Sneed. Three of the last seven tag and trade scenarios in the National Football League have been with the Kansas City Chiefs. I think that's why people feel in, in Kansas City that the tag and trade is a realistic option because the Chiefs are the team that does it. <laughs> and they've been a part of three of the last seven uh, in the last since 2019. So. Yeah, there you go. Let's move on and talk about that cornerback position that that Legere Sneed has left, though. Uh, we know that this team has three cornerbacks from the 2022 draft class. One bona fide star, uh, a player that Brett Veach went up and traded for because he believed he's a blueprint and had no idea why he was still on the board. And guess what? Brett, Brett, Brett Veach was right about that because Trent McDuffie is one of the best cornerbacks in the National Football League. Where do we go from here, though? What do the Chiefs do at the cornerback position next? Is it veteran? Is it heavy investment in the draft? What say you, Matthew? Uh, ooh, I think don't think that the Chiefs are going to trip over themselves to try to add a top-end talent at cornerback to the room. Not that they can't, and not that if the option presents itself. But remember before they took Trip McDuffie, and why when we were watching that draft, why everybody, every Chiefs fan in the world was certain they traded up for Jermaine Johnson and mm-hmm. not Trent McDuffie. It's because one, they hadn't invested anything into the cornerback position, not in the draft, not in free agency. They had invested absolutely nothing in the mm. cornerback position up to that point. They were instead developing guys. They were drafting specific archetypes. And then when they traded up and drafted Trent McDuffie, who went against all of that, a completely different body type, different play style, and they traded up for him. So like, I don't foresee them going that route again. I don't think they entered that draft with the plan of going to get Trent McDuffie. It just happened to work out that way because they had extra draft picks for moving on from Tyree Kill. So this year, without that kind of you know extra draft picks, I don't think that there we should expect them to make some kind of aggressive move to go get a cornerback. Even if you're going through the draft, if you look at it, Brett Vich has said so. You pick at the end of every round, it's hard to get a really good cornerback there because the, everybody drafts them before you do. Right. So, like, I don't know if I would expect them to invest heavily in a corner or early in the draft in a cornerback just because that's kind of been their MO outside of Trent McDuffie. And I don't think the room's in a dire need. Could they use another guy? Sure. 
Absolutely. But I don't think there's a dire need. You technically have three guys you can pencil into starters. Nazi Johnson's a little bit of a wild card who I think they had high hopes for. You can probably feel comfortable going into the year with that, even if you will take a big step back and some of the schematic stuff you can do that Craig referenced but you can feel confident in going in there. So yeah, I think they'll add somebody. I just don't know if it's going to be somebody that you spend a lot of capital, whether draft or money on. And so now that Maddie said that, they're trading up for Terry on Arnold. So congratulations, Chiefs fans. Hey, they're taking a big cap in round one. Yeah. <laughs> could be, could no. be worse. I Yeah, absolutely. It could be worse. I This is a really good cornerback class on top of that, which may reduce some of the urgency. They, like... Like both of these guys who said they've got three starters, you know, they, they've got three guys that they feel comfortable walking into the season with. And they've been comfortable with trotting them out there over the past couple of years, even one year when they were full rookies. And they were just like, oh, the Jarius got hurt. We're not going to make we're not going to panic. We're not going to make any moves. Guess what? We're still going to leave Joshua Williams and Jalen Watson out there. Oh, Trent McDuffie goes down. That's OK. We'll move Legereus Sneed inside. Joshua Williams, Jalen Watts, they feel comfortable with both of those players within this scheme. Yes, they're not going to be shadowing number ones. Nobody should be expecting that sort of thing from these guys. But on top of that, the depth that they've added behind them has been quality. Like, it really has been. We we are not very long removed from a training camp where, yes, Nazi Johnson was getting a lot of hype. And if you guys haven't read Charles Goldman on AZ Sports's profile where he got to interview Nazi Johnson, I know he's been sitting on that for a little while here. Nazi is really excited to get back in there. This wasn't just, oh, hey, we're trying to motivate these guys. He earned it. They felt good about him slotting in front of those guys. So, Nazi Johnson's a guy that they like. Echo Boydo was a guy that we were really high on, that we were trying to talk ourselves into. Hey, does this guy make the roster? Like, I'm, the, he shouldn't. They shouldn't keep that many quarters, but does he? He's another guy that's kind of floating around this team as well. They're good at finding these depth corners and these safeties that can kind of play a little bit more of a hybrid role. Shamari Connor, we are slotting in right now as safety three, and we are all very comfortable with it. I can also see a lot of nickel situations where maybe Shamari Connor, depending on the matchup, is the guy to kick down in the slot, where maybe they feel comfortable with Trent McDuffie's size on the outside in those nickel situations. They have a lot of options here. So I don't think they're sprinting to anything at this point. I, I think that I wouldn't be surprised if they finished the draft and they didn't add a corner to the room. Would I mind seeing another vet corner? Absolutely not. I think that they got room for it. I think they can make stuff happen. But if they walked out of the draft, I don't think without you know addressing the corner position, I don't think any of the three of us are going to look at that room and go, oh, they're screwed. They're in trouble. They, you know, we feel bad about it. There are going to be risks that come in, that come with those guys and things like that. But it's still a comfortable level with the DB room as a whole that they can walk into 2024 with right at this very moment. I think you've got to live with comfortable if you're the Chiefs at, a, at any position you possibly can for the most part because you have the constraints you're operating under. You have the best player in the world at the quarterback position. Not saying you don't get greedy. Not saying you don't trust your board in the draft. Not saying you don't take advantage of opportunities when they present themselves. But I think there is a logic to, you know, uh, staying, staying, staying at comfortable at some of these positions. And Maddie, I, I, I think I said this. You said this the other or last year on the draft show about kind of paying off, you know, the reward, the, the, the reward of drafting well, rewarding yourself for drafting well. This is an opportunity if the Chiefs want to hold at this position essentially and bet on Joshua Williams and bet on you know, Jalen Watson to take a step and improve and grow and can, you know, bet, bet on Isaiah uh, or Trent McDuffie becoming one of the best cornerbacks in the National Football League. This is an opportunity to do that and to trust your coaches and to allocate resources outside of the cornerback position. And maybe you take a swing on a profile you like in day three. I guess one... <laughs> It does feel like you're maybe, and maybe if and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I am curious, has your, uh, has your opinion on that changed? Because I feel like it's waffled a little bit or changed a little bit through the process, Maddie. Like maybe you, you saw it as a higher priority a month ago. If they moved on from military Sneed versus now, or am I reading that wrong? Um, I think 
I I am concerned if they have to put Trent McDuffie, Jalen Watson, and Joshua Williams out there as they're starting three corners. Um, I not that Jalen Watson or Joshua Williams are bad corners for a cornerback three, but we have seen when those two guys have had to be out there together, think back to the bills of the, you know, it was the rookie year, but think back to the bills game. They, those guys were repeatedly attacked throughout the year while McDuffie was hurt and they both had to play. I don't feel super comfortable with those being your three corners. That's why I'm hoping Nazi Johnson can come back from, you know, his injury, take a big step forward. Like it kind of seemed like there was some potential that he was this past year. Yeah. Watson Williams, very good cornerback threes when they're protected by not going up against wide receiver ones. Sometimes not even going up against wide receiver twos because that guy's in the slot and they're getting a lot of safety help because you don't have to help your other two corners. Now, all of a sudden, they're up against wide receiver ones. They can't have all the same safety help. It has to be rotated one way or the other at all times. So, yeah, I'm a little nervous going into the year with that. I'm a little nervous what that means for Steve Spagnuolo. How uncomfortable How comfortable does he feel just being like, oh, I have this entire playbook of blitzes I get to run through now versus, <laughs> oh, now I can only use the back half of my book because I don't trust these guys to go play man coverage or to lock down anybody. So yeah, I think there's definitely some risks. And for that reason, I wouldn't be surprised. I said, I don't think the Chiefs will invest early in corner. I agree. If they want to go bring in a veteran corner that's out there on the market still though, to come in and kind of bridge that gap while they find the next starter. I think there's some intriguing veterans out there. I mean, Stefan Gilmore was great for the Cowboys last year. He's still available right now. Xavier Howard been injured, not as good as he once was. You want to tell me a guy that looks like a Steve Spagnuolo corner though? Let me trot Xavier Howard out there and his like, straight vertical speed and never ask him to flip his hips and run horizontally, right? Like there's guys available right now. You Dory Jackson, like there's plenty of veterans available out there that could come in for a year that probably aren't going to break the bank that could elevate the floor of the starting cornerback room and make you feel, I think, a little bit more confident and getting to get deeper into the play calls. So, like I think they will add somebody either in the mid to late rounds of the draft, but I wouldn't rule out a veteran just to bring that floor up a little bit. And to be fair here, my comfortability also revolves around the fact that the Chiefs are probably going back to a little more static cover too. Like that's what they did. When they had, yeah, I know pain, but that's what they did when they were, you know, having to play Joshua Williams and Jalen Watson full time there. That's what they were doing when, Justin Reed wasn't all the way there with Steve Spagnuolo's play calls. That's what they were doing. That was still Juan Thornhill that was out there. Um, Brian Cook wasn't taking reps until towards the end of the year. That was before Shamari Connor was here. So I still think that they'll run some static cover too, which is why, hey, Trey White, guess what, buddy? Your great zone corner. Come play zone all the damn time in Kansas City. I'd be fine with that for a low money deal. I just think that they are going to have to shift the scheme. And there's no two ways about that because they don't have another corner like Legere Sneed. They're, they're, they're shifting it one way or the other, period. Unless they're going up and getting like a stud number one corner, which again, we don't think that they're going to spend that kind of assets to go do that. If they're not doing that, well, then all of a sudden you're going to be shifting to more of a zone heavy scheme, more of a you know too high scheme. Lots of zone underneath there. There are veterans that work with that. There are, you know, guys that they have on the roster that work with that. You can add a late guy that fits in that system as well. Those guys work well underneath. So there's where my comfortability comes from, knowing full well the scheme ain't going to be what it was last year. It's not going to be as fun. It's not going to be as exotic. And it's not going to confuse quarterbacks in the same way. But it will be fine enough with Carl Loftus, with Chris Jones, Hopefully Mike Dana back there with some of the blitzes that they're going to bring. Drew Tranquil as a blitzer had, was you know really awesome to watch last year. He's going to be playing even more than you know he did last year. So there's lots of elements that can help me get comfortable with it, but it largely revolves around the fact that they're changing the scheme anyway. I think it's also fair and appropriate to bring up that it's also not going to be 2022. It's not going to be as static as it was in 2022. I don't expect them to. I think they will be able to throw more at those third year cornerbacks than they did the rookie cornerbacks and the rookie versions. of. I know some of it to a degree is the skill set, but at the same time, I think, yes, they take a step back, but I don't think it's a step all the way back to week one against the Cardinals in 2022. I just I think there will be a happy medium found there where they're going to be a good version of themselves, 
but it's not going to be as fun as it was this year. And that's okay because Patrick Mahomes is going to score a billion points. We just got done talking about the cornerbacks as potential ads. Let's talk a little bit about some of the cap space additions that this team could make right after this. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com. KCSN Draft Guide is a little less than two weeks or right at two weeks away from releasing or I think it's a little bit less. I can't remember, but it's all running together, but we're getting close and you can pre-order the KCSN draft guys can be 300 plus pages of chief specific draft content. And when you pre-order, you get three months of the KCSN Substack, which has all of our premium articles in there. Uh, link is in the description of this show. Craig, you look like you're ready to laugh at me so I just, hard. I was just going to say that I can tell that you're a little less stressed about the draft guy by the fact that you're like, oh, it's it's coming up. Yeah, you, you don't you don't have the number of days that you're counting right now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the draft guy did a wonderful job this year. And I think having i think just I mean, more years under your belt you get more comfortable with some stuff i actually have to, i've had to do a lot more behind the scenes the last couple of years and so that has been a lot and it's gotten a lot easier so that's been nice thank you maddie <laughs> <laughs> maybe just like not i only had to edit i only had to reduce the font size on like two of maddie's pages this year so that's just a I big, I That's went back in one. and took a sentence out of uh, some of them for you. Good. I went back through once I completed all of them and took out like a full sentence out of each one. Well, you saved me a lot more time than you probably realized. So never again. Well, I didn't take anything out, Kent. I know. Oh, I looked at the kicker and punters. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to increase the font size on those. Hey. <laughs> No, it's just, we don't do as much as we don't do as much yeah, on those as we so do on the right about kickers. He's got a leg. <laughs> he got a leg. What else can this team do with this cap space, though? We talked maybe. Hey, let's try to look for a veteran corner to add into the mix here. What about you know what else was tackle running back? Are there some players that you have your eye on, Matthew? Uh, I mean, yeah, there's some players. Yeah, not a lot. It's not a big list. It's a pretty thin list. Um, like, so I think we, I don't think any of us expected Chiefs to go into the next season or even like training camp without bringing in some, a left tackle. Now, whether that's an early round draft pick, whether that's a veteran, I'm not sure yet. I, I feel like this team likes having a veteran at left tackle versus waiting around to see what's available at pick 32. But we saw last year that they are more than willing to wait until after the draft just in case it doesn't work. So we might wait a little bit, but I mean, like Donovan Smith could obviously still comes back. I'm still going to be a Mekhi Becton fan until he goes to a competent football team that runs a real offense, not being led by Zach Wilson to say that he stinks. Like I want to see him play in a real offense. So Mekhi Becton is still available. It sounds like he would prefer to play left tackle. That's fun. DJ Humphreys doesn't offer you anything right away because he's coming back from an ACL tear, but you want to tell me you get a guy that is a proven quality starter at left tackle that you can maybe get for a couple year deal to come in down the stretch this upcoming season into the future. It's like there's a couple guys at left tackle. I don't think any of them inspire a ton of excitement besides Becton for me. And that's just probably based entirely on draft priors, but outside everybody else is just kind of like a stopgap. And maybe he's okay, like Donovan Smith was last year. Kind of availability. And it's one of those where I'm, I'm almost to the point now. You know, we're just we're thirty days out from the draft. Like, I don't know that you need to address it before the draft. I, the Chiefs yeah. are going to do their PR spin where they're going to say Wanye Morris is our left tackle of the future, and that's fine. You know, they, again, everybody can look back to last year. Jawan Taylor was their left tackle of the future with Lucas Niang as their right tackle of the future. And we're, we feel great about it. And it took exactly one day after the draft for them to go, okay, we don't feel great about this. We're, we're moving on. So um, I, you're going to hear that they're going to put that out there. I, I think they go into the draft with the group that they've got right now. So I, I'm not sitting here going, Oh, when are they going to sign that left tackle? 
I would be curious to see how long after the draft it's going to be. If they have a guy that falls in their lap or maybe a guy that falls to, you know, the early twenties that they feel comfortable moving up for. Perfect. Awesome. Go, go get your guy, lock it in for the next five years. And you feel really good about left tackle. That's cool. I don't think that they're going to jump at this particular position right here because I do think that they feel good about the guys that will be available after the draft. Donovan Smith's still kicking around out there. Donovan Smith's comfortable in this scheme. He's not good or even, you know, this exceptional player that you feel really rock solid about, but he's another guy in there with Wanye Morris. That is a true competition in my eyes. Let's see what Wanye brings to the table in year two. Maybe he can take over that spot, but I don't feel like you've got to rush to that. I'm looking a little more at running back and wide receiver. I still think that this team needs weapons that they've got to add there. And if in my scenario here, you're looking at left tackle, you feel comfortable moving up for left tackle. That means that you're probably not getting a wide receiver that you're in love with right now, or maybe even one that you feel comfortable playing right away. So Josh Reynolds, it's still kicking around out here. I don't understand. Like they're taking lots of visits. Go find that guy. You know, I, I I would be just over the moon about that sort of signing. I think he makes all the sense of the world with some of the things that he does and how he would fit in this offense. And boy, I would be really excited about that. Go get another running back that you feel comfortable in pass protection. I know we talked about J.K. Dobbins before. He's going to be worth, you know, he's going to cost nothing at this point because he's hurt all the time. But so is Jarek McKinnon. So bring in a guy that's a little bit younger that can do some of those things. You know, there are a number of guys that I would be cool with them doing, but I am a lot more focused on A, bringing back Mike Dana, and B, adding another weapon for this offense as a veteran before they go into the draft so they don't feel like their hands are tied. I think Mike Dana's priority one for me of all the guys we've outlined so far i'd love to bring him back i'd love to try to see if you could bring him back on a multi-year deal see if you can get him on a multi-year deal come play in kansas city uh for the rest of his 20s basically receiver i i I, yeah i think i think receiver makes a lot of sense just to continue to add to add more bodies I, is there any other positions that you guys think? I mean, I think that's it. Like, I think it's cornerback, tackle, wide receiver, running back. Anything else and feels it. like a, we're, we're throwing Mike Dana in there. Yeah. Well. Again, I think we're all when he signs somewhere else, I'm I, you're going to see me, you know, surprise Pikachu face. But um, yeah, until yeah. then, we all assume he's back. Can you do I, that real quick and show everybody watching no, what that is, no, please? No, because okay. you set it up and now people will screen clip it. No. <laughs> I the fact that the fact that Donovan Smith still hasn't signed anywhere, I think is a telling and I mean he wasn't able to capitalize on a Super Bowl year, you know, and he's still sitting around here and he was sitting around after the draft this time last year. So like I don't think there's a huge rush. I would be stunned if the Chiefs are in some line of communication with him about his future. And of all the stopgap tackle, op- you know, guys, I I think I like him. I like him better than a David Bakhtiari. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I know some people were talking about Charles Leno a little bit as an option. Uh, doesn't count against the compensatory pick uh, formula if you sign him there. Uh, wouldn't hate him. Outside of him, yeah, though, like he's healthy. If he's he's yeah. doing hip surgery. That's the only thing. I don't know when he's he, he's kind of in the same boat as DJ Humphreys. I don't know when they would be available. Like once the season starts. So yeah, I I, I like the options you guys laid out. I think and those see, make on sense. On top of all this, I know that we are all sitting around here being like, oh Donovan Smith, oh Donovan Smith. He's the youngest option that we have yes, listed. So that's far. partially why I like him. By years, <laughs> Makai Becton is the youngest. Okay, okay. He's okay. A realistic quit, option. That the quit, Chiefs whoa, are play, quit trying to make Makai happen. I'm gonna no. Sorry, I've no, been no, listening to you happen, talk about you this. Guys, you guys are sitting here talking about just bringing back all the same guys at position groups that we complained about all last year, and you're <laughs> acting like you're happy to bring back the same people, but a year later, like what? What? No, I'm not. The, I'm not. I'm waiting until after be, the draft in the hopes that the Chiefs upgrade those positions. It shouldn't be status quo to get it, the guys back at all the positions that we weren't a fan of during the year. All the positions and, that we said in December, hey, we want to get better at those for next year, and we're like, oh, well, hopefully they bring back those same guys that we were saying we wanted to get better next year like no 
The wide receiver group's better. It is better. You can yeah, act like it's group. not, but it's better. It's one group out of defense. That's the one position you didn't say to bring back somebody. I, just, I like how that's you want to. the one. I think, well, here's the thing. I think one extra year, Juan <laughs> A. Morris, and I think you're drafting somebody. I think you're drafting somebody. I do think you're drafting somebody. You're drafting I think, somebody. I think man. you're drafting somebody regardless. Probably. I, but, it, hey, no. I just, we, I, the Makai Becton stuff is just like, no, come I'm, on. It, how many games has how many games has Makai Mackay Becton played at left tackle? And you just want to like take this flyer, this injury yes. flyer, and just yes. throw that one out there and see what happens. Yes. yes. For Patrick Mahomes blindside. Because you're trying to get better. <laughs> but do you need to go out there and take a big swing like that? Or do you need Donovan Smith, Wanya Morris, and a draft pick? The first one. And then I use that draft pick on a different player so I don't have to use it at offensive tackle to get better because I signed back the same room that we complained about for an entire season. I just love how there's so many times that you just you use the past of a player and except for Makai Becton, it's like he can people can change. We can change Makai. We can change everything this man has ever been. He <laughs> was a left year. tackle though. And I think he, Great, like listen, he, if you listen to him, he only got hurt the second year because they made him play right tackle and true. it put all the pressure on that. his right leg. And that's the leg that was injured and he re injured it trying to play right tackle. Yeah. I, you know what? Those excuses are, yeah, those are going to help. I'm sure, I'm sure the Chiefs will love that. Uh, I don't hate the, I don't hate Dobbin Smith coming back here. I'd welcome I also it. I don't hate Mackay Beckton. I just really wanted to get under Maddie's skin. <laughs> I don't hate I Mackay like Beckton, skin. but I am just like so I'm far under- removed from excited about that. <laughs> oh my god, that's the most exciting thing we've talked about. <laughs> oh. no, my thing is just get better than last year. Don't like sit here and be like, oh, yep, let's just bring back the same guys. And like, I think you two, and not to say like in a negative, but you two are much more okay with that. And I watched those guys play last year, and I remember having to do shows every week about how we wish those guys were all better. Why am I hoping for that again? Is just kind of like my counterpoint again fallback plan like i yeah. i want to go into the draft i want them to trade up for guyton and feel really good about left tackle <laughs> yeah. and i want them to add another just... wide receiver for the draft and i would feel much better about the offense as a whole to be clear or i think end, or I... running back or anybody I... that wasn't here last year but maddie i think it's impractical to expect every position to improve on a roster okay, let's just try for more than one <laughs> I think we quarterback is getting better this year. He just and, he just gets better. On the outside looking in, players do get better and we just pretend like they don't sometimes. Not us, but like just in general, it's like we just solely rely on the past on these players. Like there isn't projection to some of them. So the Chiefs are going to try to rely on the players that they draft and develop to develop. Like that's going to happen. And we can sit on the outside and say, we can say, oh, it's just the same as last year. Or we can say, this is a big year for player X. And if it doesn't happen, this group is the same as it was last year. Like, I don't know. That's that's part of part of building a roster is developing these players. And they're going to have to develop players at some of these positions. I'm just saying. We're going to have to be on the outside looking in going, well, you sure about that? And then they're going to be sure about that. And they're going to win a third Super Bowl. And then we're going to do this whole thing all over again. And Donovan Smith's going to have three rings in his uh, in his. Uh, pocket or case or safe or wherever he wants to put that third ring some rule changes have okay maybe he doesn't want to wear them you know not all the time doesn't want to to wear them can we talk about the hip drop we could talk about the hip drop okay cool so the nfl has imposed rules basically banning the hip drop tackle um, it's the hip drop swivel of specificity. They're basically trying to keep defenders from pulling down uh, run ball carriers from behind and dropping their body weight onto the bodies of ball carriers. I think it's it's not entirely removing the hip drop. It's trying to get rid of plays in which r- ball carriers' legs can get caught from underneath them. And so the NFL is imposing a rule that bans that. They are saying there's been about two, there was about 230 of those types of tackles last year. 
those tackles are increasing and it's something that they are concerned about. It's more specifically on the body weight falling on the player, on the ball carrier, and, and you know catching those feet underneath them like what happened to Mark Andrews. It's not the entirety of that tackling technique, but they are trying to essentially remove that tackling technique from the game. There's no way this ends badly, Matthew. I mean, I don't, I don't think it does. I think it's going to be just like every other hitting penalty that's ever been enforced and that we're going to get really mad at a couple when they start overcalling it in preseason and to start the year. And by week three, it'll normalize. And there will be maybe two throughout the entire season that are so borderline that they cause a big uproar. But you said there's 230 some that they identified. About they're one a game. Two, they're going to, they are going to call 228 of them and no one's going to care about those 228 because you're going to say, Oh yeah, that's against the rule. Maybe I don't do or don't like the rule, but you're just going to get used to it and it's going to be fine. And there'll be a couple like, I don't know, let's say the tackle from Justin Reed on Tyler Boyd from the 2023 AFC championship game where it's like, really, that's the one you want to put on your video. That one doesn't fit the same as the others that you've shown in my opinion. So we'll have to discuss that one. But for the most part, it's a smart rule. I I mean, I know people don't like it because they think it takes away the game, but like rugby's done this for a long time. It, not a long time, but a few years now, they've had success with it. It's not a dirty play. It's just an unnecessary play. There are other ways. Yeah, you're going to have to give up a few more yards. A runner's going to get an extra yard or two. You just can't throw your body weight on the back of someone's legs while you're pulling them backwards. It's pretty simple. It's the same concept as a horse collar. You're just getting unnecessary injuries from the the levers and the movement of or like in force and the way you're applying it there. And then when you throw your body on the legs as well, it's just unnecessary. So like I'm okay with the rule. It'll just take a couple weeks to get used to. I do like the approach that rugby brought to it better than the NFL, though. Like the the penalty is gonna be the one that's gonna matter. That's gonna actually influence games. That what rugby did is they just started finding the crap out of everybody who did it until it went away. And so it was <laughs> yeah. still happening in games. It was just people got tired of their, you know, their wallets being lighter. So it gradually worked its way out. This is another judgment call that now you have to put on the ref's plate. And we you all love the Steelers. We we all love when the referees, you know, get to make more judgment calls, get to do more of this stuff. That's the part that I'm worried about here. You there are so many things that these guys have to do, have to cover, and it's no wonder at this point that these part-time employees are missing things as the game adds more and more rules. Now there's another one here that is subjective. Was there enough twist? Did he did he fully land on him while twisting? Was it for, directly from behind with both hands? Was it just one hand? Was it just – it's going to be a lot of that. And that's what I hate about it. Uh, the, the rest of the rule change is trying to limit defense, trying to increase offense and all that. I'll just uh, – Mike Mitchell, Steelers safety – has a perfect comment on it. Go look that up. Him complaining about how I, you know, he left his feet to hit Tyler Eifert. Andy Dalton threw a terrible pass and he ends up hitting Tyler Eifert in the head. He gets fit, fined fifty thousand dollars because Tyler Eifert has to lay out for a ball after Mitchell's already committed to the tackle. That sort of stuff's never going away. And if you're gonna try and penalize these guys, you're gonna try and do that. I, I I'm with him in that regard. You got to have something that swings back the other way. This I am more concerned about referees not knowing how to officiate it appropriately, not enacting it appropriately, costing games, costing you know extra stuff for some of these players. It's going to be one of those that it's going to happen in like week 16 to a team. They're going to miss out on the playoffs. Bengals. Gonna, yeah, the Bengals probably were going to go back. And now all of a sudden it's going to be like, oh, well, maybe we were a little too harsh, and then they're going to remove it. You know, it's oh, going to remind me of like when they reviewed PI <laughs> for like two years or something like that, and then they just went, "Oh, yeah, yeah what, what was on the field is called," and you know, it went away because nobody wanted to call it, nobody wanted that in the game, so it made its way out naturally. Implementing this, putting more on the rest plate, is just. I, I, I don't like that. I think it's going to get called improperly and inconsistently, and it's going to affect games. So let's get on to a couple of these new little rule changes that are happening here. Uh, coaches are going to be awarded a third challenge if one of their first two challenges hits. I don't think that's an absurd rule. I don't think that's adding a ton more challenges to uh, 
to the game. I think it's helping them be a little bit more aggressive and intentional in getting things right. I think that's a great rule change. I don't know if anybody has any other any issues with that. Do you? No. No, I actually really like that one. I, I wish they would have gone to that one a little little before. Makes sense. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that's good. Um, one of the big proposals, though, that is kind of coming out that people are trying to... It hasn't been agreed upon yet. It may not actually get ratified here uh, at the owners' meetings, but the, they are looking pretty heavily at at the kickoffs and kind of creating uh, more action on those kickoffs and creating more uh, action, kind of essentially forcing like a play to happen, but doing it so in some kind of safe manner by essentially putting both the kickoff team and the returning team close to each other and the blockers in, in, in proximity of each other, creating a kicking like a landing zone where basically a ball has to you know fall inside the red zone from the zero to the 20 and if they don't the ball goes on the 40 but it's kind of creating it's creating action it's doing it in a safe environment that's kind of limiting the full head-on collision that some of these guys experience on special teams and allowing a little bit more one-on-one blocking matthew do you like this do you like these changes potentially to the to the kickoff i'm torn um, I think it'll make the kickoff more exciting than what it has been in recent years. Because since they last kind of like updated it, you've getting a lot more touchbacks. Nobody really kicks off. It's kick return specialists are just are, are no longer as common or much of a thing. We all remember like watching guys like Devin Hester or Dante Hall get back there and return kicks. And it's like that was appointment television for a while. And over the past I mean, 10 years now, like Every now and then a kickoff return breaks and it's fun. It's cool. It's fun to watch, but nobody's like waiting at the edge of their seat for a big kick return to come. So like I get the desire to change it. I think this will definitely make it a lot more fun. My hesitation is this is so different than what you have right now from where guys are aligned to the zone that you have to kick it in and all this different stuff. There's going to be a year or two if this goes in effect where Some team is going to figure out the right strategy. They're going to, whatever they do is going to be right. And they are going to have an upper hand based entirely around a new rule. And if this is a kickoff, like this has to happen every time your defense gives up points, you have the chance based on a new rule that everyone's trying to figure out all of a sudden out of nowhere, you have a chance to set yourself up, give yourself, you know, they call it hidden points or stuff like that. So it's just, it's a little weird, not weird, but it's a little off to me that a just completely different random out of nowhere rule that is going to come into play. What? between six and 10 times in a football game, you might just simply have a better strategy than everybody else. That's brand new. I don't know that that part's a little weird. We'll have to see if a team really jumps out ahead of everybody else on it or not. But like, that would be like my one hesitation about it. You see, Maddie has hesitation. I'm excited for that. Like <laughs> I, I'm excited for some, like one rogue special teams coordinator. I don't want just... the Panthers to just dominate the kick return game for absolutely <laughs> no reason. And I win three games that they should. All of a sudden it's like, what the Panthers won seven games this year? How? And you get to go because of the new kickoff rules. Like no. how awesome is that, man? Like it's incredible. No, I, there's, there's going to be times it, it, I feel a little bit for, you know, organizations that, you know, they knew this was coming. They knew that this is a possibility. It's obviously not into effect yet, but there's a lot of strong indicators that it might be coming into effect soon. There are a lot of organizations now that are making decisions about roster construction, who they're targeting, things like that. And, while we all joke, is ah, yeah, that guy, he'll just play special teams. Ah, he's backup corner. He'll just play special teams. There are considerations given to that. We give Dave Tobe a lot of crap for having decision-making on this team. It's paid off. And there are a lot of special teams coordinators. It's not just Dave Tobe. A lot of special teams coordinators that get to make decisions like this. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to have a lot of question marks in those rooms. Hey, can Harrison Butker just... Land one there at the five yard line consistently. We feel comfortable with him doing that. We, you know, we we built him to be this kicker with this booming leg that basically never allows any returns ever. Hey, now all of a sudden, Harrison, we're going to try and organize this in a way that you can have the ball bounce at the three yard line and bounce into the end zone. So that way they start on the 20 rather than the 25 or the 30 or the 40 or whatever it ends up being. It just adds another element to it. I'm excited to see how it plays out on the field because it's an actual meaningful rule change that does something in the NFL. And I'm curious to see how 
they game it and how they organize it. But some of this roster construction matters for some of those sorts of things. Harrison Butker is, uh, again, this big booming leg kicker. Now you're going to ask him to be a little bit more of a placement style kicker. They, uh, there are a lot four of four specialists on a roster. Cool. Listen, man, it matters. Those, those 53 roster spots matter. So I, I don't know. I, I'm curious to see if we see maybe a little more focus on specialists now that you can game the system a little bit more, because again, this is not a small amount. You can bounce it in. That's a 10 yard field difference that they have currently. And, you know, obviously if if you miss it completely, it's 20. Like this, this is a massive, massive difference in starting field position. All of a sudden that they're suggesting. Thanks. I hate it. Uh, (laughs) I just, I, I think anything that, could create a level playing field against Patrick Mahomes. I don't want. I'd rather it, I'd rather play by the rules of the current NFL that don't create this chaos and additional variance for the Chiefs to do some you know lose in tragic fashion in the playoffs because they give up a stupid return on this new rule. Like I don't know. I I think this is a I think this is a very big just a very big drastic change which I think is why it's being potentially tabled until May if things don't really go particularly well in these conversations because it is a big move. I'm sure the special teams coordinators would love it because then Dave Tobe gets two extra guys on his roster because this is a moment in the game that is so crucial and vital to you know to to success. I just I don't know. I, I it's a great rule to pass next year when you give all special teams coaches another year to like workshop what they want to do versus just dropping it now. Like now everyone's gotten familiar yeah. with the rule. We all see the diagrams. Not that the you know, not that these special teams coaches haven't, but you just give guys a little bit longer to ramp up to and prep for it. And I think you hopefully that leads, you know, gets you away from the craziness, the chaos that you're talking about from one team randomly getting an edge on freaking kick returns because you changed the rules on them. And now you just have some one-off team that apparently can, you know, play in the margins on special special teams over and over again. So like just, I think it's a rule that probably makes a lot more sense that let everyone get familiar with it this year and then actually pass it next year. Cause it does sound like it'd be more fun to watch. I mean, it's definitely going to be more fun to watch. It puts more importance on the kicking game. And now it puts a little more de- importance on defense as well. Cause if you have a bad kicker, you might be starting at the 40 more often. You need a quality defense all of a sudden there. I know that it's about trying to maximize points and reduce injuries. And this, I, I feel like, accomplishes both of those. It's actually a logical thing that could accomplish both of those. But I'm, yeah, and I'm with Maddie here. Like, propose it this year. Get all of the, the machinations worked out and then sit down and go, okay, guys, we're going to, wink, wink, we're going to vote on this, right? Okay, everybody vote no. We'll table this. We'll come back to it next year. Y'all have been warned. Get ready. (laughs) Uh, Man, as someone who spent a lot of time on special teams in my collegiate career, I want to value, continue devaluing special teams. (laughs) I just scared to compete. That's what I'm hearing out of Kent Swanson right now. I don't want, you know, some five, six, 145. I want two, two at well to all of a sudden. I know it's not two, two at well. I just listed two, two's measurements, but I just don't all of a sudden some random kick returner to have more bearing on, on the fate of Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs. That's all. I don't mind the returner. It's just, it's a brand new thing. It's just a brand new thing. All your blockers are starting from a standstill. The ball has to be kicked into a certain zone. So how often is the ball going to end up at the 20 and all of a sudden the return starting there because these kickers can't like, I just, there's so many unknowns. That's more my concern than a returner being good. I'm fine with a good returner. You want to be talented enough to be Devin Hester and like fight for the hall of fame based on your ability as a returner. Cool. Have at it. I just don't want to see somebody that's not very good at returning win because the rules stink and they're (laughs) brand new and nobody knows how to handle them yet. That's my holdup. 
if the rules go into effect, just go ahead and sharpie in Malachi Corley or Xavier Leggett in round two for the Kansas City Chiefs because sure. both of those would be exceptional <laughs> returners in this scenario. And honestly, I think the Chiefs should consult Maddie because if there is a rule to find a way to break, Maddie Lane will absolutely do it. That is going to do it for the KC Laboratory. Thank you all so much for listening. We love you. We appreciate you. We'll catch you later. Just want to know about unannounced onside kicks downfield. That's-